Welcome back to... How long till we next play? I was on a podcast the other day and I was asked a question about Arteta's impact at Arsenal. And I did that thing, and we all do it, where I opened my mouth and I had no idea what was about to come out. I sort of went down a meandering path about Arteta's time at the club, leadership qualities, not quite sure where I was going. Then in an attempt to qualify some tangential, dubious point I was making, I found myself trying to calculate how many hours of Mikel Arteta speaking I probably listened to at this point. And I shocked myself. I listened to every press conference pre and post game, including the embargoed one, so probably half an hour put together in total, and every pre and post game interview to club and broadcast media, which is probably 15 minutes in total on average per game. I've definitely missed a few here and there, but I catch almost all of them. And I also watch any feature he's involved in on the likes of TNT or Sky, exclusive interviews like the one he gave Amy Lawrence or Jamie Carragher, old interviews, interviews on the club website, all or nothing, podcast interviews, and so on. So let's call that maybe two hours a month on average. So 45 minutes per game for 219 matches he's been in charge, plus the two hours a month in the 38 months since December 2019. I reckon I've heard him speak for something like 14,415 minutes, which is just over 240 hours. 10 days straight of Mikel. And yes, before you comment, I am an absolute nerd. In any other context, that is stalking. A lot of Mikel saying, well, first of all, before everything he says, and a lot of journalists essentially rewording the question, do you want to win? Would winning be good? Before a typical politician's answer from our handsome Spaniard. But among that are moments, golden moments, you might say, that we can really unpack and get a sense of who this guy is. You might not agree with my analysis, but hopefully you agree that I, I, I've put in the hours. Here's what I think are Mikel's three most revealing or important moments as Arsenal manager while speaking to the media. Moments that tell us why, at least in part, we are where we are. Number one, my chest is here, hit me guys. Let's set the scene. December the 15th, 2020. You've probably seen this picture that goes around of Arsenal's 10 game streak at the end of 2020. We were in honking form. One win in 10 away at United, lol, with seven losses and two draws. This press conference came just before the 1-1 draw at home to Southampton, the one where Gabriel was sent off. Pain. It's difficult to summarise just how bad the mood was in the Arsenal fan base unless you lived through it. We'd suffered through the end of Wenger, the apathy under Unai, and many now thought we had a total dud in Mikel. It was also peak COVID and the Christmas that Boris cancelled in the UK. Good times. At the time, I'll say I was backing him as I've always been impressed by his communication and principles, but I was nearing the end of my tether too. I was in the trenches in group chats and I was running out of arguments. We were 15th. Tottenham were first, for goodness sake. I wish I could play the clips, but I'll get struck for four-year-old press conferences, but you can go and look all of these up. Mikel is asked, essentially, is it right that the manager gets all the stick when the players are the ones who are out there on the pitch? And he replies, is natural, I accept, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> it's natural, I accept it, it's part of the job. When you're not getting results, at the end of the day, as the manager, you have the maximal responsibility. That's why I accept them because you can say whatever you want to explain, but at the end, you have to win football matches and this club is too big to accept this many losses in the last weeks. So my chest is here and hit me guys. What he says probably isn't fair. Yes, he needs to take responsibility for his part in it, but you also need to look at the poor recruitment, the underperforming players, the executive unrest, the lack of planning and so forth to fully understand what got Arsenal into that situation. You don't have to throw anyone under the bus, just refer to it. That's probably more accurate. But accuracy and fairness isn't the point. At the time, there was a vacuum of public-facing responsibility taking at Arsenal. There were very few players other than the likes of Granit Xhaka who wanted to front up to the media. The club were getting better in their communication, but certainly weren't as good as they are now. And the leaders we look at now on and off the field, like Adu, Rice, Erdegaard, and so on, either hadn't quite established themselves or weren't there. Josh Kroenke was nine months away from his We're Just Getting Started interview, and the scenes outside the Emirates after the ESL announcement hadn't even happened yet. Here, Mikel shows a common theme in his communication, emotional intelligence. He recognises what is needed for Arsenal as a collective above his personal pride. What Arsenal needed was for someone senior and public facing to take accountability for the results. And so he did. He said, blame me in his first job when he didn't need to. It's like being in an argument with your partner. Yes, you could go back and forth about the washing up, even if you did clean that spoon. Or you can compassionately accept what they're saying, even if it's not fair, and seek to iron out the real, more complicated cause of this. Maybe they don't feel listened to or they feel unloved at the moment. It's emotional intelligence to recognise what a situation needs. 
And this, of course, isn't the only time. You can find countless examples of Mikhail saying this sort of thing over his tenure. This is probably just the most well-known occurrence. Now, you might be thinking, so what? Nothing special? He should take the blame. He's the manager and we were losing. Firstly, saying that massively ignores the other factors that aren't Mikel's fault that led to the run of results that we were going through. But secondly, let's look at other managers in the same situation as Mikel and see what they do, even those who have far more managerial experience than Mikel had at the time. I'm not dunking on other managers because it's not about point scoring as a fan. I just want to bring them up to show you how what Mikel does at the times he's done it shows a depth of character that isn't as common as it might be. And look at his face when he says it. He wants the responsibility. And when you actually try and put yourself in his shoes and try and imagine a manager in the present at a club of our size in 15th, United, Liverpool, City, Chelsea, all those clubs, imagine them enjoying that responsibility. It's not common. And you can see partly why then we are where we are. It's worth saying I have seen him throw his players under the bus once, Pepe after Leeds, though I may be missing some examples. Honestly, Pepe deserved it, but he hasn't done it since, and he's had many opportunities to do so. Number two, Liverpool at home, July 2020. Arsenal beat peak Liverpool at home at the Emirates in July of 2020, and after the game, Mikel is talking about the team when Jeff Shreves asks him how big the job is to rebuild the team after his first half season in charge. Mikel says this, massive. You only need to look at the difference between the two teams today, and the gap is enormous. The gap in many areas we cannot improve in two months, but the gap between the accountability, the energy, the commitment, and the fight of the two teams is now equal. And before, it wasn't like this, and I'm very proud of that. The rest will take some time, but at least that, we've got it now, and my message to the players is with that, we can create something. It's a terrific quote. After a 2-1 win against a side of that quality, you can forgive Mikel for speaking about the qualities and praising his players, but instead he's honest and frank about where the Arsenal team actually are in their development. Most people like the idea of the process. Most people. But why is that? Well, in my opinion, I think as fans, it is the hope and the journey that's almost on reflection the best part. I was at the Porto game last Tuesday, and although the outcome was brilliant, of course, it would have meant so much less without the context of 14 years away from the quarterfinals, how long and painful that game was at times, the first leg loss, and so on. It makes the win so much sweeter. The fun is in the challenge. But an enjoyable football process can't happen without foresight, which is the word I want to highlight here. It can't happen without someone at the helm who can tell you, through great skill and knowledge, where you've been, where you are, and where you're going. Big picture, and then communicate that in an understandable way, as he does here. If you don't have a manager who can go from the micro of a substitution or a tactical tweak to the macro of a five-year plan and explaining how we restructure a football department, and who can then articulate that, the process becomes a little bit muddy. And in moments like this, post-Liverpool, we see that foresight. How well has that quote aged? And the more we keep hitting the checkpoints he lays out, as he has done many other times, the more we feel like we're going somewhere. And I think the more fun it is. It's like a car journey, but you're lost. It would be much easier to relax and enjoy the scenery if you knew where you were and when you're arriving. Mikel gives us that sense of security. He's driving, we can sit back and enjoy the journey. But that only happens through his qualities. And here we see them. Not getting caught up in the moment, in the stories, in the weeds of conversations, means he can triumph. He shows here, but in general, an ability to never do results-based analysis. Just continue doing the right things. Next game, next game, next game, and you'll get there. One percent, half a percent every day. It's easy to sit on your laurels when you win, but it takes a proper manager to remain focused on the task in hand in the glow of a perceived success. Process over everything. And Mikel's foresight is partly what's making this process so special. Number three, we can be much, much better. This next one is more recent. May the 12th, 2023. Arsenal are due to play Brighton, and although the loss in that game would effectively put the nail in the coffin, at this point, Arsenal were still only two points behind City with all to play for. Mikel is asked, in a title race still, how close he sees his football to its pinnacle now he's reached the point of competing with Man City. And he replies, We are still very far. We can be much, much better at a lot of things still. Huge margins. We can be much better in our build-up, attacking man-to-man -man situations, attacking open spaces, defending deep, set pieces, game management. A lot of things we can do. We can be more ruthless to kill games. We don't have a single player who's reached his peak. No one. There is a kind of hilarious thing in football which doesn't really get discussed, but when you step back and think about it, it is really bizarre. Imagine your mate had a job they've been training for for basically every day since they were about six. They have literally tens of thousands of hours of expertise on the job. Not only that, but some of the best people in the world at that job think your friend has everything to be considered one of the best himself, 
and he's now performing at that level. Then, your mate tells you, there's a new guy at work who's had three hours induction training and the company let this guy pay to sit there and just abuse your mate, shout instructions, tell him what he's doing is wrong, call him every name under the sun. And not only is that accepted, it's encouraged and people listen to the new guy over your friend. Like, they'll take his opinion more seriously on the job than your friend. And your friend also has to thank him after every session. Can you imagine how mental you think that is? Now, of course, that analogy isn't exactly applicable to football. The fans make it a viable business model. Mikel isn't perfect, and you are allowed to criticize him, even with less expertise. And also, I find being deeply in something doesn't automatically make you the most articulate or interesting analyst to listen to about it. In fact, I think it can blind you sometimes, as we see from ex-footballers who go into punditry. I feel like I'm a fairly clued-in football fan who at least tries to understand the game. And if you'd asked me at the end of last season, where can we improve? I'd have had an answer, but not with that level of detail. It's very easy to sit there after the game or at the game and say what you think is going wrong or after a good result to say what you think went right. But to spot the patterns over time of exactly which parts of the game model haven't yet reached their peak and to be able to be specific on each player's ceiling of improvement, that is hashtag ball knowledge. I can't hashtag ball knowledge. Get a piece of paper right now and try and plan a coaching session to take to Arsenal first team training tomorrow morning to fix the issues we currently have in the team. I would be absolutely clueless. And it's not only the level of detail, but the ability to actually get that message across and see the improvements we've seen this year in the things he mentioned, like our game management, set pieces, our build up and so on, that's coaching. And it's the same with signings, to have the depth of understanding of the actual game itself to see the potential improvements in the summer. Mikel exactly predicted the impact Rice would have, but who was calling for the upgrade on Ramsdale? Who was calling for Kai Havertz? Nine times out of ten, he gets it right. And I hear you. Yes, it is Mikel's job. He is paid for it. I get that. But my point is, in moments like these, you realise the gap in expertise. And that's before we add in the difference in communication skills, people management, upwards management, and so on, that's got him here. I'm rewatching All or Nothing at the minute, and it's reminding me that even in club-approved flashes, where we probably don't get the real juicy detail, this guy understands the game to an incredible level. And you realise we're in incredibly safe hands. I'll leave you with this. Mikel's first interview for the club. Go and watch it again if you haven't, because it is insane how well it's aged. He talks non-negotiables, environment, chemistry, having passion, dominance, aggression, playing in the opponent's half, creating the right culture around the club of accountability, creating the identity he wants. All of the messaging we're used to now was in that first interview. It's his football, his vision. He called it day one, and now we're seeing it. The foresight, the understanding of the game, the emotional intelligence, this is a proper manager. There have been some other brilliant quotes and interviews over the time he's been here, of course. There's good as you. I have very wild dreams, his defending of Havertz. But in the many hours I've been watching him, you've always felt that palpable sense of intensity and a desire to improve. As Mikel says, you can always get better in life, innit? And we now, because of that, have the chance to go on to have Arsenal's most successful season for 20 years. If you like The Different Knock, you can support us on Patreon monthly, or you can buy us a coffee.